Uh, so, hi, I'm Sasha Kostovic, uh, indeed VP of Technology at a company called Audio Analytic. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to, to talk at the Data Insights Meetup. Thank you for being here tonight. Thanks for, to me, Tel Sobia. And we hope you're going to enjoy this talk. Uh, we've put it uh, more on the uh, creative, like uh, we're going to try to get your juices flowing, your creative juices flowing, and we're going to try to make you think about data in a certain way. Maybe some of you already think mm -hmm. about data in that kind of way. Uh, but what we're going to talk uh, about tonight is filling the sensory gap uh, in big data. What does that mean? I'm going to start with a big uh, statement. Intelligence is the perception of relations. Um, that's, that's something that has been said by a philosopher called Henry Berg Bergson. Uh, he got the Nobel Prize of Literature in 1927, I think. Um, but just to say that as uh, data scientists, what we're trying to do is to get intelligence from data. So intelligence from the experience, from measurements and so on. And that's what that kind of bidirectional arrow is symbolizing is we're looking for relations between things and between data quantities. Um, so one of the tools we use is the correlation or correlation so that's the relationship between two types of data quantities uh, you can that's about as much math as you're going to have in this talk so uh, letter greek letter rho uh, of xy is rho is the relation between x and y x and y being two different quantities of data so at the simplest level um, you might uh, un uncover relations if X, then Y. If something happens, then something else is correlated to it and happens in conjunction, in correlation to that. Uh, sometimes uh, the way we extract this from data is not a uh, clear cut if this, then that, but it's if, if X, then maybe Y with a uh, raw percent of a chance that those things are going to be uh, related. We all know that. We're all data scientists. That's very simple. Uh, simple example of that, uh, weather forecast, if it's cloudy today, then there is 95% chance um, uh, of rain tomorrow. And for example, weather forecast, weather prediction has value. We use those things to sell to other people, either an application or the insight that's being, uh, that's being uncovered by these relations, those core relations. We all know that, we're all data scientists. Uh, but the thing that I want us to look at is not really the relation itself, it's the nature of uh, x uh, of data x and y and the question i want to to, to ask tonight is uh, is there a value that can be uh, uncovered not by looking at the relations per se but by looking at the nature of data that uh, that we are manipulating and can the value come from that different way of looking at the nature of the data itself rather than at the relations so let's take a little historical walk uh, along uh, <coughs> natures of data uh, to illustrate that, that idea that uh, uh, let's think about the nature of data. So earliest uh, data collections were census and phone directories. Since uh, 1801, you had census data. Uh, the nature of that kind of data is text data. So most, uh, I mean, in the early days, it is covering, uh, in, in the case of census data, it's covering age, gender, uh, the address, which is a, f a form of static uh, geolocation, er early form of geolocation. That's where you should be most of the time. Um, your phone number, this is contact address. Uh, so it's starting to uh, outline uh, profiling of people just in terms of, in very simple terms of census and phone data. Um, but also something interesting in, in text data is uh, medical records. And medical records, again, I don't have a precise date, but they, they, they date from way back. And if you look at these two types of data, for example, you can do something like this. Uh, so breast cancer care, <laughs> there we go. Uh, you can uh, start and uh, tr try and predict your cancer risk. Uh, you can correlate the risk of a certain medical condition with census data. So this uh, thing tells you uh, the three main breast cancer factors are uh, your gender, sex, being a woman, and so on. So that's census data. Your age, census data again. Uh, and family, uh, same thing, your family tree and so on. This is text records, essentially. Um, now, since the 80s, there is a new type of, of data, which is consumption habits. So uh, 1981, Pascal Pasky was the precursor to what uh, was in 1982, the Sainsbury's home-based spend and save card, which was one of the first uh, ever loyalty cards in the, in the UK. And uh, that was followed, the uh, Tesco jumped on that kind of thing uh, much later. 1994 is the Tesco club card. Um, <coughs> and those things are tools to correlate uh, census or directory data 
uh, with consumption habits to target promotional efforts. The, the value number one of that is we know that you're buying X, therefore we can uh, uh, bring that as value to uh, people who want to do promotion of pr products in the same league, for example. There's all sorts of value that can be extracted from that. But again, that's a, a type of data that was not really accessible before 1981. Um, and that was uh, mostly enabled by the computerization of cash, cash registers and, and stock management. Uh, the, the, the computerization of, of the buying process just uh, helped that to happen. Um, now, uh, if we do a little jump back in time, media consumption habits. So yet another type of data. What is it that people watch? So uh, 1927, <coughs> sorry, first TV set. Um, 1942, first uh, institute which was manually measuring the TV audience, and that was happening in Brazil. Um, 1953, uh, first TV ad ever, so Seiko, Seiko Shah at the time uh, watches on, on Nippon TV. 1973, Nielsen's Audimeter, which was the first computerized way of uh, measuring uh, media consumption habits. Uh, so again, the idea here is access to uh, a different type of data, which is TV consumption. Uh, and if you aggregate uh, this uh, TV consumption data with census data, uh, you can predict or you can target sales. Uh, but again, th those kind of applications were because some new type of data uh, arised, and that was media consumption habits. Um, so with correlation and aggregation of that kind of type, you can do uh, things like uh, raw percent of Super Bowl watchers are men aged a certain age and are interested in lager beer there. Therefore, uh, you would target your, uh, your uh, advertisement for beer during the Super Bowl. Um, and in a way, TV uh, became also a way to structure time. You're going to show certain things at certain times because you know who is watching it when and you know what it is that they are watching. Uh, there is another type of, uh, of uh, kind of myth or archetype which was uh, 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 existing in the past generation. So my mother probably was considered as the TV watching, daytime TV watching uh, house housewife. So all the advertisement for washing powders uh, and so on or cosmetics were during daytime TV. Uh, so uh, again, the mashing up the TV consumption habits with who is it that's watching TV uh, was a kind of uh, profiling of, of people already, which was uh, which arose with uh, the, the, the that new type of TV of um, data, which was consumption media consumption habits. Now, from media, uh, things uh, uh, migrated to the internet. So, internet consumption habits. What happens in this space? Uh, 1975, first PC by IBM. Uh, 1991 World Wide Web, so computers uh, were less of a big pocket calculator and were more of a communication tool. Uh, 1994 Amazon, and that's an interesting one because uh, suddenly the buying process was happening online, so you didn't need the physical scanning of uh, all the objects to have access to the uh, uh, registry data. So who is it who is buying and what it is that they're buying. Everything happens directly into the web, into the computer, into the cloud. Um, 1998 is Google, um, and from what do you buy that becomes what do you watch online. So uh, people's interest or people's profiling doesn't happen only in terms of uh, their consumption. Uh, they like noodles, they like beer, but also in terms of their interest in other things, uh, what it is that they watch, and things which are not necessarily available on TV. So what is it that people are uh, searching on the internet? What is it that people are talking about uh, in their emails? Uh, and that's a, a new type of data which uh, reaches people profile uh, already at a deeper level. So uh, across all these different stages, we have a deeper and deeper and deeper levels of access to people's profile, who they are and what they're interested in. 1999, Friends Reunited Network is the precursor to, uh, is one of the early social networks. Uh, 2003 uh, is the rise of uh, Facebook. And Facebook has a bit of a different approach because instead of uh, looking at what people are interested in, Facebook is trying to make people interested in something. Uh, so there is a bit of, a, of an idea of owning people's choices of, of what to watch and feeding them all these videos, which you, you don't even have to click the start button. Uh, everything is just fed to you. Uh, and you don't have to, li to, to leave Facebook. You're going to have that constant stream of, uh, of interest. And that keeps you in a place um, uh, where, where you have all, all these things, uh, and at the same time trying to correlate that with some interest of yours. Um, modern days, so rise of the smartphones. 
uh, now from the desktop internet that becomes internet in your pocket. Uh, there is an extra thing about the smartphones which was not possible before, which is uh, geo geolocation data. Uh, and so geolocation data has uh, an applicative value, okay, all the mapping uh, systems and where are you and don't get lost and how you can find your way in cities. Uh, and there is some kind of a hope to uh, use data mining of, of geodata to uh, help, again, profiling people and, and know more about, about people and about humans and about consumers and build uh, some extra value on top of that. Uh, but I don't have the feeling for the moment that, that uh, using geodata, data mining geodata has gone very far yet. Everyone is talking about um, advertisement related to the place where you are. I don't see a lot of that happening yet, uh, but maybe that's because of privacy pushback. We don't really want uh, something actively chasing us wherever we are and, and actively triggering actions. I, I don't know. But anyway, s there we are uh, at in modern times. Uh, new type of data again. So again, this is about type of data. Geolocation that was not accessible um, uh, before uh, 2007 or, or whereabouts. Uh, so, walking through that history, so we said uh, uh, first early questions, what's your name, what's your gender, where do you live, that's the type of data that what people were able to record at these times. 1970, what do you watch on TV, what is it that, uh, yeah, what do you watch on TV, how do you select uh, your programs. Uh, 1980, what do you buy. <coughs> 1990, what do you watch and buy on the internet. And 2000, where are you right now, so instant geolocation, not just where is your address, like where are you at time t equals now. But the question is, is that really uh, enough? Is that really accounting for, uh, for human experience? Is that really connected with people's mental state? Uh, how much is that tell you about, telling you about what people really want? Uh, so it's consumption, but it's not really an active, uh, active mining of who you are, what you're doing, and so on. Um, and smartphones in that respect are approaching a new dimension. And that dimension is, what do you see? Everyone now is taking selfies, is having ins Instagram accounts, posting them on Facebook and so on. And there is quite a lot that you can infer from pictures. If you look at those two pictures, you have happy people and you have a sad one. Uh, you can infer that just by looking at the picture. Uh, you have people who are outdoors and you have someone who is uh, indoor. Uh, if you had a super powerful uh, uh, mining algorithm, you might be able to guess which, uh, which uh, fountain is <coughs> behind them. So um, in a way, Smartphones are giving access to yet a new type of data, which is vision. So how far have we gone uh, with that? So, uh, and again, this is modern times. This is now, happening now. Uh, this is the defunct um, uh, Fire phone from Amazon. The phone itself has all sorts of flaws that people argued about and so on. Uh, it was too expensive, whatever. Uh, but one interesting thing which was in the phone was this uh, service which is called Firefly. And Firefly was using the uh, uh, image capture from the phone and uh, there was an identification algorithm uh, behind this uh, vi uh, visual captation. And uh, that application was able to tell you what is it that the phone is seeing. So uh, you're seeing this book, and this book happens to be available for sale on Amazon. <laughs> what a coincidence. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, but they were uh, promoting it in much wider terms of Firefly is going to see what you see, uh, uh, provided you point your uh, smartphone at what you see, um, and it's going to uh, make your life easier and build all sorts of uh, service value for the customer, so applicative value. Uh, helping you to buy things in an easier way or maybe telling you where you are or, or helping you to translate uh, text into another language, something like that. Uh, but then behind that, there is probably uh, an idea of now you have access to what people see, to their visual, uh, visual experience. And another thing that happened is this. And when those guys did that, I was like, what the hell are they trying to do? This is the Google Glasses. And thinking about it and looking at the context and w at what's happening in this era, my hypothesis, but I've never been able to verify, it, is that what Google was trying to do is capturing your vision and trying possibly to correlate your vision with other stuff. Correlating your vision with where you are, correlating your vision with your taste, correlating your vision with what? Are you happy? Are you not happy? I don't know. I'm not sure what kind of data processing was uh, a grand scheme was behind the Google Glasses, but the Google Glasses was clearly, uh, I think, an attempt at uh, capturing uh, your vision and accessing uh, your visual experience. 
what, what uh, uh, how to say, how, how much more obvious can you make it than to put it in the glasses? It's like it's not in your uh, phone in your hand. It's really in f capturing your eyes, owning your eyes. Um, then same story. What is this guy trying to do? Why is it that Facebook bought uh, Oculus Rift? Is it that just like with Facebook, they try to capture your internet cons consumption habits? Are they trying to put your vision in a box? Are, you, are they trying to uh, create a space where they uh, retain and capture your visual experience and then try to do something else with that on the data side of things? So if we go down that route of saying, aha, now uh, all these devices are, uh, are, are surfacing some notion of sensory data, which was not accessible before, but which is accessible now. Uh, if we try to expand that and, and, and expand that to uh, all the five uh, senses, what, so instead of who you, wh wh what's your age, where do you live, and so on, you can start asking, what do you see? Uh, what do you smell? What do you feel? Uh, what do you taste? Uh, what do you hear? Sensory data. So let's just walk through these things. So what do you see? We've seen the examples of Google Glasses, the Firefly, and so on. So I'm not going to um, spend too much time uh, on, on, on these ones. Uh, we have good examples already. There is a whole a lot of things happening with neural networks for image processing and so on. So people are definitely trying to do something with visual data. Um, now, what do you smell? Now, that's an exotic one. Who has done anything in that space? What can we actually do? Well, actually, uh, noses were early smoke sensors, aren't they? You can smell the gas, you can smell burn. And so to, uh, to an extent, uh, smoke alarms are a very simple uh, form of, uh, of smell sensor. They're, they're reacting to presence of certain chemicals in the air. So that's a very, very simple example. Now, what's this? This is a breathalyzer. <laughs> Have you been drinking tonight? <sighs> Not yet, but I will later on. Uh, <laughs> So um, this is a, a form of, uh, of uh, smell sensor or something that analyzes the chemical in, in vapor, in the form of vapor. What would you do if you had one of these in your smartphone? I don't know. Is anyone doing anything interesting with that? Why not? Um, this is called the Sierra Nose 320. And it's a very sophisticated electronic nose. And it's got an array of 32 sensors, which is able to uh, detect the presence of 32 different uh, classes of chemicals in vapor. Uh, for the moment, that's an industrial uh, apparatus. It's used. I'm not exactly sure exactly who I uses that in their applications. Um, but uh, it does have bundled with that uh, sensor a whole suite of uh, machine learning algorithms. And you can actually tailor the function of that thing to you, you can train your own pattern matching in terms of uh, 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 correlating some measurements of chemicals in vapor to uh, uh, the pr uh, an application, a label. Like if there is this pro chemical profile in my vapor, then that means that I have a gas leak or that means that I don't know, I'm making the right kind of perfume or this and that. So again, uh, if you had that in a consumer product, what would happen? Like is there, is there interesting things we can build on sensory data, on sense of smell. I don't know. Uh, one thing which is not di directly related to a sensor but was an attempt at building value on, uh, on sense of smell is a website called Base Notes where they uh, correlate perfumes, fragrances. Uh, it's a whole directory of fragrances and they tell you, okay, if you look fragrance X, then you might look fragrance Y. And they built some correlation between uh, types of fragrances based on uh, what, uh, based on the human, I mean, people actually, uh, you know, Web 2.0, like people adding the contents to that and saying, okay, I like this perfume and that one. And that's how they built their database of, of relations between fragrances. Uh, so it's not directly uh, a sensor but it's a service based on something which is related to sense of smell. So those guys had an idea with, okay, instead of correlating, I don't know, senses, consciousness, and thought, okay, let's, let's get interested in two fragrances, in two sense of smell. It's a way of speaking, of, uh, of thinking about things in terms of sensory data. Um, what do you feel, sense of touch? So what can we do in that space? Um, temperature is something which is related to the way you feel. You feel the temperature. Uh, so um, notions of uh, comfort around temperature, there's lots of that in the Internet of Things at the moment. This is the Nest um, thermostat, so something which is uh, trying to uh, adjust the temperature so what you feel uh, as a sense, it impacts your, your, your feeling of comfort. Um, this is something which is related to the sense of feel. Um, what else? Um, 
So this is an exotic one. So the small letters here say start an entirely new kind of conversation. This is the Apple Watch. And in the Apple Watch, there is that uh, thing called the Taptic Engine. And Taptic Engine so does those vibrations either to do alerts, but they've done something uh, kind of interesting, which might be a first venture into some form of communication and, and feel of data, which is um, it can sense your heartbeat and recreate your heartbeat into someone else's watch. Uh, and I think there is also an application where you actually, if you tap the watch, you could actually do Morse code between your watch and someone else's watch. And so that's a very, very basic attempt at, at sending some field data. Um, I'm not sure exactly what we could do with that yet, but again, it's a venture into something which is, right, now we are playing with the sense of touch. Um, and is there a way we could mine the sense of touch somehow? Now, there's also that kind of thing that looks like a necktie clip or something, I'm not sure. That's actually connected sex toys. And you have a number of startups in that, uh, in that domain and trying to do uh, long distance uh, vibrations and stuff. That's related to the sense of feel. Is there some kind of data mining or some kind of profiling that can be do with, done with that? Is there some kind of aggregation that we can do uh, between sense of feel and other types of data? Not sure. What do you taste? Um, so this thing is the TS5000Z, and it's a taste sensing system uh, <coughs> manufactured in Japan, uh, I believe. And it's, uh, with that, you can measure and visualize the taste of food, beverages, and pharmaceuticals. So you can measure quantities uh, uh, around the five type of, uh, of taste, so uh, salty, salt, sweet, uh, uh, acid, and so on. Uh, saltiness, astringency, richness, and sharpness. Um, but that's, for the moment, is for industrial applications. What if you had a smaller version of this for consumer use? So there you go. This is the uh, Gusto from uh, Kansai University, which is a small, reduced version. I don't think that thing has gone further than just a concept stage, some kind of master's project or something. Uh, but again, sense of taste. Could you correlate that with what people like and don't like? Um, so, at the moment, thinking about the sense of, of taste, uh, so you have uh, websites doing, for example, correlation in restaurant taste, so uh, the same idea of, uh, as base note, but for food. So if you like this, then you're going to like that. Um, but sensors in that space are just starting. What if we had access to people's sense of taste? It's a bit futuristic, but you know, why not? Right, and then what do you hear? Uh, so we've seen things like uh, Shazam and Soundhound, which are foca focusing that idea of uh, that question of what do you hear on music. Okay, you're in a nightclub, you want to know what's playing. You uh, get your phone. Phone gets the same, hears the same thing as what you're hearing. Shazam and Soundhound are telling you what music this is. Um, and again, you could correlate that with uh, demographics, uh, census data, and so on. I'm not sure if you could correlate, for example, music with health data. Why not? Um, this is the logo of the Siri uh, system on the iPhone. So there is a whole lot of, uh, of Siri-like devices. This is the Amazon Echo, which is a sort of like a tabletop version of the Siri system. It's a device which, uh, which you put on the table. It's like a um, at the simplest level, it's a loudspeaker, okay, it's able to play music with very good quality, but it's also able to uh, pick people's speech uh, in far field. Uh, I've seen a demonstration of, of that thing, and it is able to hear someone on the other side of the room uh, giving an order, hey, uh, so the persona in there, so Siri uh, is the sort of like persona, you have a kind of virtual assistant persona between, be behind this kind of uh, sensing. Uh, Microsoft has Cortana. And uh, Amazon Echo, the persona is called Alexa. So you go, hey, Alexa, and then the thing starts blinking, and then you can uh, do all sorts of actions, play this, play that, play music, and so on. Uh, so Siri and uh, Alexa are uh, owning the uh, sense of hearing when it comes to speech. They're mostly uh, targeted at speech. Now, what about all the other sounds of the universe? Uh, you know, someone uh, coughing in the assistant, some cars going uh, out in the street, and so on. And that's the space where uh, audio analytic is, is evolving at the moment, is making something out of uh, acoustic sensory data. What is it that people hear and what kind of value can we build on, the, on top of that? So um, the, the way we explain what we do in, in simple terms is if there is a sound in your house and no one is around to hear it, uh, then uh, audio analytics AI3 uh, technology will let you know. 
Uh, so at the simplest level, we're doing a sound detection uh, in the uh, home, home environment. Um, and uh, some of it is for security applications, some of it is for other applicative values. So we have a portfolio of uh, seven sensors at the moment. Uh, so we can tell you about the sound of smoke alarm, <coughs> sorry, the sound of glass break. We can alert you if your baby is crying. So if you're at the other side of the room, gardening outside and so on, we can send you an alert if your baby is crying on the first floor of your house. Um, we also have uh, aggression, so aggressive speech, uh, safety application. Um, we have uh, car alarms, uh, gunshots, and uh, keywords as well. Um, right. So in a way, what we, uh, what we sell is acoustic intelligence. We're addressing the smart home uh, market, uh, which is one of the sort of sub, uh, subsections of the whole Internet of Things uh, wave uh, at the moment. Um, and uh, with that kind of capability in a smart home system, uh, we also contribute to creating, uh, to give a, a persona to the, to the system. Uh, so I've put this, uh, this uh, image of the big, big hero. Is, uh, I don't know if you've seen the movie. It's an uh, animation uh, movie. I think it was last year. Big Hero 6 is, a, is the title of the movie. And that robot, instead of being a whole mechanical robot, is an inflatable thing. And uh, the goal of this robot is to care for people. And he's uh, designed in a way which is very huggable, very soft, and so on. And so that's an image of a robot who is protecting someone. And in the movie, the, that robot is... Uh, providing medical care, but the idea here is having some technology which protects people and reassures them. Uh, so having uh, sound recognition capability uh, in, in homes, so uh, uh, if you had an assistant, for example, a microphone which is able to hear threats and so on, that's a factor of, uh, that's, uh, that's technology which is reassuring people through some sensory modality. An interesting thing about that is also adaptive behavior. Uh, because then we can have systems which react to a particular sign, uh, type of sound. Uh, one thing, for example, personally one thing which uh, doesn't work for me is my thermostat at home is an old uh, Honeywell system or something. Uh, uh, it uh, switches off the heating every uh, day at 11. But sometimes I go to bed at 11, sometimes I go to bed at 12, sometimes early, sometimes. So I'd rather have something which is able to sense uh, what I'm doing in the home, sense my activity, uh, and, and uh, adapt the behavior of the home to what I'm doing. And one of the main indica indicators of what is it that, that people are doing in their homes uh, is the sound of it. The sound of dinner is different from the sound of uh, TV watching, which is different from the sound of uh, uh, having a nap or when I start sleeping after, I don't know, 11 or 12. Uh, maybe the snoring <laughs> is going to be uh, an indication of, of, of what is it that I'm doing at the moment. So that's in uh, terms of uh, applications, okay? Uh, but now the interesting thing about it is that uh, that gives access to acoustic features and acoustic sensory data. So the X or the Y, so the nature of the data in that case is related to the sense of hearing. Uh, so there is one question about uh, is there something that can be done if we were aggregating that uh, kind of uh, data, so acoustic sensory data with other data sets. Is this something that we can find out by aggregating uh, um, the sound of people's activities in homes, for example, with uh, some notion of security where, I don't know, insurance companies, for example, uh, would be interested. And that's what we are we're exploring at the moment. So to wrap up this talk, what, what's the big idea, what's the thing that I was trying to, to sort of get us, uh, get us to think about um, is uh, and I put you the big hero again because I really like the <laughs> that hugadelic uh, robot. Uh, but anyway, that was the big idea to come back home and, and hug, is um, questioning the nature of the data at both ends of the correlation process and uh, thinking that this can be the driver for new value. So not just trying to get to that process, but also thinking in terms of, aha, if I try to address a type of data that no one has addressed before, that's where my value is going to come from. And we've seen that happening in history when new data happened. And so with the evolutions of sensors, like more intelligence in vision, more intelligence in hearing, more intelligence in possibly other senses uh, in the future, uh, maybe something interesting can be done. And so the, 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 the generic sort of uh, end point is uh, uh, what this talk is trying to promote is sensory data is the new frontier. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I, I hope you're going to have questions after this talk. Uh, just a shameless plug, we're launching our own um, uh, meetup. 
so 24th of November is going to be the first uh, audio analytic tech talk. It's going to be talks which are about uh, machine learning with the bias towards uh, uh, acoustic data, but not only. We are uh, open to inviting uh, machine learning experts in other areas as well. Uh, it's going to start with Professor Mark Plumley uh, on the November 24th. Uh, the uh, title of his talk is uh, Making Sense of Sound. So he's one of the uh, locomotive of sound recognition in the academic world. Someone we really enjoyed working with. So he's going to be talking about that. And uh, in February, uh, we're having uh, Dr. Emmanuel Benetos from uh, Queen Mary University in London talking about non-negative matrix factorization, which is uh, a method to uh, decompose audio data. So if you're available, if you're interested in those things, by all means, uh, please join us. Thank you very much. <laughs>